All right, let's pray together. Would you pray with me? Father, I'm thankful today that we can wake up with our minds set on Jesus. That before we roll out of the bed, we can say good morning to a God who hears us, who knows us, and who loves us, and who is aware of every circumstance in our lives. And you care. And you don't just care, but you're powerful to work through those circumstances to bring us to a different place, a better place, and the kinds of people we are. Father, I am very, very aware right now of my own weakness as a person who would communicate in your stead and for you and give voice to your truth. God, I, I cannot do this by myself. And I want my brothers and sisters, my friends and family in this room to, to hear me say that because I am keenly aware of that this morning, that I cannot communicate eternal truth by myself. The best I can bring is an opinion. And God, there's not a person in this room that needs to carve out an hour of their time or two hours of their time or any hours to hear my opinion. So God, I'm going to ask you right now to speak clearly, distinctly, personally to every person in this room. It would be inescapable that your presence and your voice would be known in each one of the circumstances represented in this room, that there would be not one person, if it's only for this next 30 minutes, God, that, that there would be not one person that feels alone in this room. Alone with their circumstances, alone with their pain, alone with their fears, alone with their, with their sorrow or depression or their sense of isolation, that, that you would invade every one of their circumstances, their questions, their, their, their fears, their anxieties, their hopes, or even their excitement, that you would just invade all of those circumstances, that your beauty, your glory, your power, your love would just be made known in a powerful way today. God, these are things that I'm asking that I could never ever accomplish our music can't accomplish it this building can't help accomplish it your spirit and your spirit alone can do this so would you be with us as we do our best to tune into your voice for the next few minutes together we love you but we're very thankful very thankful that you love us first it's in Jesus matchless name we pray amen I don't know how many of you know Richard Taylor here today. And he's our, what used to be called the director of missions of our association of churches and Flint Hills Association of Southern Baptists. Richard's not here, is he? Richard here? Sometimes he comes, sometimes he doesn't. Nope, not here. Good, I can talk freely about Richard. <laughs> I don't have anything bad to say. One thing about Richard is funny is Richard will call me and on my cell phone. And not only do I have his you know, name in my contacts list, but there's a picture of Richard that comes up. But even if I didn't have that, if you know Richard, you would know that his voice is very distinct on the telephone. Like you would know Richard's voice anywhere. Richard could call me in the most unsuspecting time of my life, and I would know it's Richard's voice. But every time Richard calls, Richard says, Casey, Richard Taylor. <laughs> Doesn't he, Brian? <laughs> Brian, Richard Taylor. Really? <laughs> Would have never guessed that. It's a warm, comforting voice. I'm not saying anything derogatory. I just know Richard's voice anywhere. He doesn't have to tell me it's Richard Taylor. I think it's absolutely hilarious. My, mom, my mom's been dealing with Alzheimer's, early onset Alzheimer's for several years, and still has a very good long-term memory. Her short-term memory is not good. Which, and I, I'm not being, for, you know, I'm not being disrespectful, but that does make conversation challenging at times and very easy at times because I always have something to talk about with mom because I could tell her, you know, what the kids did yesterday and I could tell her the same thing next week. And literally, she doesn't remember that uh, many times. But the cool thing that I'm always amazed about is I pick up the phone, I call her, and I say, she says hello, and I say, hey, mom, and she has four boys. And she says, Casey, every time she knows my voice. Every time. She, she totally knows my voice. 
you know, hang on to those, those introductory thoughts and let me, let me weave that into something that's really, really significant today. We've been on a couple month journey about talking about what it means to invite other people to live life in God's kingdom. To not just say, isn't it good to live life in God's kingdom ourselves? Yes, it is. It's really good. But it's even better. It makes our joy complete, to use the language of Scripture, to in, begin inviting other people into that experience, into that life. And more recently, we talked about how do you do that? How, how do you do that? I mean, we, we uh, have been through many phases in church life of how to invite people to church or invite people to accept the gospel or... You know, from handing out scripture tracts to doing promotional events to doing... How do we best invite people to live life in the kingdom? Not just to believe in Jesus or to pray a prayer or, or to even attend a worship service, but how do we throw open the doors of God's kingdom and, and, and put on display its availability for other people? How do we partner with God in our world today to be those who could effectively, consistently proclaim this invitation that it's open to everybody. How do we do that? And we said the first thing we said is we have to adopt a live sent mentality. That we have to see that that's why we go to the school that we go to. That that's why we go to the job that we go to. That's why we have the neighbors that we have. and the friends, So that we can be an ambassador. That we can say we are sent into this world to herald this good news to proclaim this invitation, to, to throw open wide the doors to God's kingdom and say, hey, we are one beggar telling another beggar where we found bread, the bread of life. So we live sent. We can also say this very important, very, very important, perhaps maybe the most crucial thing we can do is to speak from experience. And by that I mean we have to speak from within the kingdom and the experience of the kingdom, not theoretically. It's really easy to speak theoretically about God's kingdom because many of us still don't know the tangible reality of living in it and experiencing it, even though we have stated that we placed our faith in Jesus, even though we believe that when we die we're going to go to heaven, we haven't been enveloped by the reality of life in God's kingdom ourselves. And so we want to talk about it, and we can talk about it, but it's not very good in terms of effectiveness to say, Man, I've heard God's kingdom is really good versus saying, man, let me tell you how rich it is to live life in God's kingdom. So we have to speak from experience. We have to live a sent life. We have to speak from experience. And then we have to begin to be willing and learn to be willing to meet people where they are, not where we want them to be. I don't mean physically. I don't, I'm not talking about whether you go to a bar or whether you go to your neighbor's house. That... That is important, and we have to be willing to not let geographic boundaries limit us. But I'm talking about where people are in life. We said we can't expect people to show signs of life outside the kingdom before we invite them. We can't always wait for a neighbor to come to us and say, Hey, it looks like you go to church every Sunday. Could I go with you? We can't always wait for the co-worker who has lived this, this pagan, ungodly life in front of us all the time to, to show a sign of spiritual interest before we throw open doors to the kingdom to him and or her and show them the life that we have. We have to meet people where they are in life and not be repulsed by them or not be offended by them or to not even look at them and say that's a hopeless cause they'll never come towards Christ how do we know they would come towards Christ unless we show them Christ okay so we have to do those three things live sent have to speak from experience we have to meet people where they are and today it's maybe the bottom line of nuts and bolts of how this happens on a day-to-day -day basis and, and we're going to talk about what this fourth piece is from the vantage point of inviting people into God's kingdom. But it has a lot bigger uh, spectrum of relevance. I mean, this could speak to a lot of different life situations. It's not just about inviting. But it's a very, very important thing to do. It's easy to think of inviting people as this activity of inviting people into the life of God's kingdom as just marching orders. Do you know what I mean by marching orders? That God says, hey, you're one of mine. 
here's your responsibility, go do it. And I want to tell you today that if that's somewhere in your frame of reference, whether that's inviting others to the kingdom, into the kingdom, whether that's reading the Bible or praying or anything, that, that God does not give marching orders in terms of, here's what you should do, now go do it. God gives invitations to us. Here's what I'm doing, come join me. Because it's all about relationship, right? God does not need us to get stuff done for him because he's God. God wants us to partner with him because he loves us and he's our father. He's invited us to join him. So if we transpose that thought onto, if we put that thought on top of inviting people into God's kingdom, then we're in partnership with God in this adventure. And we don't just have this thought of, I got to go do this. That's a big responsibility. But rather, understanding that God is saying, come with me. See where I am working. See people through my lenses. See situations and circumstances as, as orchestrated by me. So let me ask this question we'll kind of launch in. How do we, how do we let God actually lead us to know who to invite? And when to invite them. To know those two things. Who do I invite? And when do I invite them? Does God have a will on that? Or is it just a random activity that you're supposed to do at your will, at your discretion, at your wisdom, at your timing, and your all and everything about you? Or is this saying God, or is this God saying to us, come join me? And what I'm already doing. Does God have a plan and a purpose here? Does God just say go and do it and expect us to carry out the mission? Or does he have an offer of partnership on the table that we have to either accept or reject today? And it could change everything, the answer to that question. So here's what we need to get. I'm just going to tell you the answer and then we're going to expound on it, all right? That's fair. You like the answers first anyway, don't you? You can fill out your little listening guide. There are no tests, by the way, if you're here. You're like, there's a listening guide? This looks like a, a test review sheet. <laughs> you don't have to fill that out. You can if it helps. We can and we should recognize and respond to Jesus' voice in our life. Now, I know that seems like an overly simplistic statement, but I want you to hear that as a literal truth that I am convinced is a reality in my life and can and is a reality for many people's lives. But, but just grapple with it for a second. We can and we should learn to recognize and respond to Jesus' voice in our life on a day-to-day -day basis, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis at times. Just as, as literally as you respond to anybody else's voice that you hear with these ears. So let me pray one more time that God would... I just want to ask God to take his word here and drive it deep into our hearts. God, as we read these next scriptures, I'm just asking that the power and the inherent presence of your, your presence in them would, would be manifest. God, I'm asking for you to speak just in the way that I'm describing that you do. Would you do that right now as we read these next few scriptures together in Jesus' name? Amen. John 10, 27, Jesus said these words. He said, my sheep recognize my voice. And I know them and they follow me. My sheep recognize we are the sheep. Recognize my voice. I know them. And that could be a powerful truth for you today, that, that phrase right there, that, that Jesus knows you today. He doesn't know you like he thinks you should be. He knows you as you are. And it could be an absolute mess. It could be on top of the mountain, life's never been better. But, but the Bible says Jesus' words were that day. These, these are literally uttered from Jesus' own lips. My sheep recognize my voice. Now, if we're not being all religious and pretentious, 
or just going with the flow that we've always gone with, I wonder how many of us would say, yeah, I, rec- I really do. I recognize Jesus' voice in my life. I've tuned into it. I, I know it. Versus, I wonder how many people would say, well, I know that that's, that's how we talk about it when we read the Bible, that this is Jesus' voice. And that is true if we understand that in the way we're going to unpack that. Okay, so I want you to hold on. This is really, really, truly... This could be... I say this about every sermon, right? Because I need my ego pumped up. (laughs) This could be life-altering today. That was tongue-in-cheek, by the way. I don't need my ego pumped up. Everybody will tell you my ego is big enough. That was a joke, too. (laughs) There we go. I was watching a thing on Johnny Carson, and he... (laughs) This just reminded me of, he, he said this absolutely hilarious joke, but no one laughed. I mean, Johnny Carson, the king of jokes, drops of just, and the whole audience just fell silent. And Johnny Carson didn't even know what to do. Johnny Carson, he's like, he looked up and tapped on the microphone like it was, it was absolutely hilarious. That was not in my notes, but it sure reminded me of that. And so when I, when I do this, this is generally my cue for you to laugh. <laughs> There's a lot of power in that. <laughs> wow. All right. Jesus says, my sheep recognize my voice. <clears throat> my, what I want you to do with that is, is be really honest with yourself to say, I might, I don't know, or yes, or <laughs> no, I don't have any clue what you're talking about unless you think, unless you're talking about when I read the Bible that I'm getting God's quote-unquote voice. All right? Uh, to recognize, by the way, to recognize Jesus' voice means not just to learn to hear it or discern it. In this language, it means to, to obey it, to hear and to obey. It has all of that. They recog- and it's, it's much like, and the illustration he's using is when a shepherd would come and they would, they, would, they would pasture the multiple shepherds would have their flocks together and a shepherd would come to separate the sheep they would just call their own sheep. And the sheep were, it's really cool, sheep aren't smart, but they did recognize the voice of their shepherd. And so that's how they separated them. They didn't have them tattooed or marked. They just would call, the shepherd would call, and, and the sheep that belonged to that shepherd would come to them and they could separate them out that way. And so it's a powerful illustration that they would have understood really well and, and that we can grab hold of today because when, when, we are, when we are identified as sheep and we, he says, hey, my sheep, those that belong to me, learn to recognize my voice. They can hear it and they respond to it. And they're obedient to it, okay? God wants to communicate with you in real time. In real time, in your real life, in your real circumstances. And that, and that God has a voice that we can learn to recognize and respond to. That is a statement that you can, you can blow off this morning and say that's just part of the sermon and I'm just really looking forward to going to the restaurant after lunch or, or taking a nap and oh, that's all nice and it sounds great theoretically but I don't think it's practically true but I want to read it again. I want you to just open your heart and your mind to it and try to wrestle with it because this is not something you can just go, oh, yeah. I mean, listen to what I'm telling you. You've got to think I'm absolutely crazy or you're going to have to say there's something here because I'm telling you that God of the universe wants to communicate with you in real time in your life. By real time, I mean in your step-by-step flow of your life, in your circumstances, not just here, but in, in, in your workplaces, in your schools, in your homes, in your neighborhoods, in your cars, in the hospitals, in counseling offices. God wants to speak to you, wants to communicate with you in real time. And God has a voice that we can learn to recognize and respond to. Now that's the best news I've told you all morning, that God has a voice that you can learn to recognize, hear it, and you can respond to it because it's clear and, and, it, and, it, and it makes sense and, it's, and it communicates to us. Some people have, have, have asserted, and I don't doubt them, that they've heard an audible voice. God's clearly made His voice audible in the Scriptures. I've never had that experience, but I will tell you this, and I do not mean to overstate my case at all, that 
there are times when God speaks and it is clearer than it would be even if it were audible. That is, I'm as certain as I've ever been that I've heard from God. The thoughts that happen, the truth, the insight are so not of me and so clearly true they could only be God. Jesus, speaking to Pilate during his arrest, he said, everyone who hears, who is of the truth, hears my voice. Everyone who has embraced his kingdom, everyone who is trusting Jesus of the truth, hears his voice. Do you hear his voice? Have you learned to do that? I'm going to tell you something. I've been a pastor for quite a few years. I've studied the Bible a long time. Not as long as many, but for a long time. I've read a lot of books about this stuff. And I'm, I tell you this because I think it's important for you to hear, mostly. But it's only been recently, in the last couple years, that I really think I've learned God's voice. And that's not because it's hard. It's because I didn't necessarily believe I could. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's not complicated. It wasn't, I didn't have to read a deep theological book to learn the art and master the skill of hearing God's voice. I just had to kind of go, wow, God does have a really clear voice. I'm not saying God never spoke to me beforehand. I, I just don't think I was very aware that, man, that is a direct communication from the Father to me. And I can live in that kind of relationship because he wants it and he's made it possible. So this is totally exciting to me to share with you. And again, I think it has a great deal to do with how we invite others because there's a prompting of, of his voice that tells us when, where, and how and that we can depend on instead of just saying, you know, this is, this is my responsibility so I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. And then we don't do it because we know our abilities aren't very good and it seems too big of enterprise for us to take on. So the writer of Hebrews uses the same kind of language. Listen to what he says. He says, therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice. That's what God says. If you hear God's voice, that means you can. So if we think about it, it only makes sense that God would make his voice clear to us, doesn't it? I mean, if God wants relationship with you, can he have relationship with you unless he communicates with you and you can communicate with him in real time? In real time. So if God has in mind fellowship or relationship with us, he has to be able to communicate with us. We cannot be responsive to him. We can't be obedient to him in life's circumstances that are varied, that are multiple faceted. They have all kinds of angles and and, and nuances. We can't be obedient or responsive to God in our daily lives if we can't have real-time communication with Him. I'm going to challenge your thought processes because mine has been challenged a great deal, uh, especially on how we view the Bible. Many, many conservative evangelical people, I think most, would say, this is God's Word. This is God's Word to us. Many have said to me, this is like God's love letter to us. There's a, I think I agree with an, the element of truth or where that's going, that is, it's born in love, it's communicated. But I reject today the fact that this is like a letter. I want to reject today that the Bible is like a letter to you. And I would propose to you that that's a dangerous perspective of God's word. That it's like a letter. And let me explain how. If you were to suddenly lose, can you imagine what would happen to our world if we suddenly lost the communication abilities that we have through texting or even through the slower medium of, of email or uh, what is more prominent now, Instagram and other Snapchat. And the, the, There's kind of an immediate... If we lost all that, even if we lost the ability to use this as a phone. Did y'all know this is a phone over here? <laughs> I know they don't ever use it. You don't ever see teenagers walking around like this. Never do that. It is a phone. Because we pay the phone bill. But what if we lost that? What if 
many will remember these days, but many literally, you're sitting among people who will never have done this, what I'm about to say, have written a letter to somebody. You're sitting in a room with people who have never handwritten a letter to somebody and mailed it. Can you imagine what it would be like if your only form of communication was through snail mail? You have to handwrite a letter and mail it to somebody. Now I want to challenge you right here and say, can you have the same kind of relationship with somebody if your only medium of communication is handwritten mail? Because here's the best it can do. Okay, Even if they live 10 miles down the road, it's going to be the next day at best that you can get them the communication. But most of the times it's going to be three to four days if somebody's very far away. So you have to write the letter, you have to address, you've got a stamp, you've got to put it in the mailbox, somebody's got to come pick it up, they've got to drive it, fly it, or somehow other ways, uh, you know, run with it maybe. I, they don't do that anymore. But to get it to somebody, it's gonna, there's going to be a lapse in time. So the circumstances in which you communicated to them will have inevitably changed to some degree by the time that they read the letter that you got, that you sent them, Right? Something's going to have changed. It may have gotten better. It may have gotten worse. It may have not changed a great deal, but just time has passed, so perspectives change. Everything changes. Now, here's what I want to do. If that's how you understand the Bible, that this is a letter that God wrote to you a long, long time ago, that it's static. By that, I mean it's, it's, it's stuck in time. A long, long time. It's still true, you believe it's true, you believe it's mess, but it's like God was, you know, thousands of years ago wrote this down, and we just keep passing it along like a cherished letter. Then it doesn't give you the ability to hear God's voice in real time. That is, He's speaking to you, but you're gonna go, but it's 2016. Things have changed. God wasn't. That things weren't like this when God wrote this. If, if that's how you're viewing Scripture, it's going to, at the best, severely limit how you relate to God and the perspective you have on your relationship with Him. People think of the Bible like a letter. Like God wrote this letter a long time ago. It's still true. It's still good. And, and it's stuff God wants me to know about Him and about how to live but it's not real-time communication. Do you hear what I'm saying there about real-time communication? That God's speaking. I'm speaking to you in real-time communication. It would be even more real if I was speaking to you one-on-one -on -one and you had just divulged or shared with me your circumstances in life and I was responding to you right then and there, face-to-face, -face, about those. You would feel, if I did an, even an average job, you would... Of communicating with you, you would feel connected to me. I may not offer solutions. I may not have any solving, uh, be able to solve your problems, or, or, but you would feel connected. That's how we feel. As I share from my life, you respond to me in that real time, and something's lost if, if a great or even a brief period of time changes or passes before that response because things change so rapidly. Now what I'm telling you is this, is that God wants to respond to you. He wants to communicate with you in that kind of real time, in your real circumstances. And the Bible is not static. It's not stuck in a set of circumstances a long, long time ago that it's not just a letter that God wrote and we're just passing it along through the generations to read. It is still his very, very... The most amazing thing about the Bible is it's alive. This message, these truths, are still the real-time voice of God. In your world today, in your life, pick your circumstances. I don't care. It could be a jail cell. It could be a funeral home. It could be in the boss's office while you get the best promotion you ever got in your life. It could be in the birthing center at the, at the, at the most blissful moment when you see a child born. It could be at the wedding altar. It could be in the intensive care unit. It could be in your living room. And God can speak to you. So why is it so important to memorize God's word? To hide it in your heart. To come to a one on Wednesday night and help kids. You wonder why we do that? Ministry that's aimed at helping kids memorize. Is it so they can be good little Christians? 
so they can spout out verses and impress others? Or is it so that we can prepare our children to learn to hear the voice of God in real time? So that when they face tri trials and tragedy or triumphs and they're, and they're tempted to maybe even just walk away from God in the best moments of life because things are so good we forget about Him. Or they're tempted to walk away from God because things are so bad that we blame Him. That we teach kids and we teach each other that the voice of God is real and active and present in your life today. He wants you to hear Him. Not just hear about him. He wants there to be a two-way street of communication. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, For the word of God, listen to this and soak it up. Like, like you are a parched person. for You're just in the desert of life and you just need to drink so badly because we do. And we need this truth like that. For the word of God is alive and active. That's how it describes itself. It's alive and active. What does that mean? Real-time communication. Written by men long ago. But it's today alive and active. That's what it says. Sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It judges in real time. It's the voice of God into your life. Not the only, listen, you don't have, God, we're going to talk about it just briefly in a minute. This is not the only medium. You don't have to open the Bible and read it or recall a scripture for God to speak to you. But I'm telling you, it really clarifies stuff. It really does. It's very important. But if God is going to have a relationship with you, if he's going to know us and we're going to know him, then we have to be able to have this kind of communication. Delayed communication or static message from God is not going to enable us to be obedient in, in the present circumstances that we live. And God, of course, knows this. So what has he done? Is this just a mystical thing that this is really kind of alive and it's not really just paper and ink? No, 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 no. God has done something very, very practical, very, very tangible, and very, very real. Jesus, when he was dealing with his disciples, and he knows what's coming, that he's leaving physically. That he's going to be crucified, but he's going to be buried, he's going to be resurrected, but he's going to leave them physically, and they're going to go, what? This was not the plan. By the way, did you know that? The disciples weren't going, hey, Jesus is going to leave us, and we're going to carry on his message with another. That was not, they were like, what? That's why Peter said, when, when Jesus said he was going to be crucified, Peter said, no, never, never. It's not going to happen on my watch. And, and, and that was such a, a wrong statement that Jesus said, Satan, get behind me. But Jesus, knowing how hard this was going to be, said, said these words, listen to these. He said, I'm going to ask the Father and he will give you, in my physical stead, he will give you another helper. That he... Listen to this, in the brokenness of your life, in the mess where you are, in the best times of your life, listen to this, he may be with you forever. I don't care where you are. I don't care what you're going through. The Bible says this, Jesus spoke these words to his disciples and it's true today. I'm going to give you a helper and he's going to be with you forever. He's going to be with you always. And I don't care what circumstances you're in. You're going to be able to be with me, no matter what. That, that he is the spirit of truth. He's always going to be able to speak to you truth in real time. Whom the world cannot receive because it doesn't see him. We can't see him with our eyes, so the world's not going to buy it. Or know him because it's done through faith in Christ and not just... It's not just an, an inadvertent happenstance circumstance. It's through deliberate, intentional faith in Christ. But you know him, he says. You know him because he abides with you. He remains with you. He is faithful to you. He is with you, in you. I will not listen to Jesus' words today. Hear them from your life today spoken to you. I will not leave you as orphans. Can you see Jesus standing in front of you, maybe kneeling down in front of you right where you're at and asking you to look him in the eye and saying, I will never leave you as an orphan. I didn't play a dirty trick on you. I didn't say, hey, let's get all excited about this Messiahship and the kingdom of God and then boom, I'm gone. 
I'm not leaving you as orphans. You may feel orphaned at times if you don't know this truth. You may feel like God has abandoned you in life. Like your circumstances couldn't possibly bear witness to the truth that God is with you. You may feel orphaned, but Jesus says, look me in the eye. And I'm not Jesus, I'm just saying that. So you would envision him. I'll never orphan you. He said it again in Matthew 28. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Because he gave you the Holy Spirit. Who is the constant, real-time voice of God in your life. He uses... This is the sword, the Bible says this is the sword of the Spirit. This is the voice that he's going to use so often. I can't tell you how many times Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 has gotten me through. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, not some of it. Throw it all on him and lean not on your own understanding. Casey, quit trying to figure this out. But in all your ways and everything, acknowledge me. Just turn back to me and say, God, I'm scared. God, I'm afraid. God, I'm sad. God, I'm excited. God, I'm distracted. God, I'm bored. God, I'm disillusioned. Everything, acknowledge him. And I will, not maybe, I will direct your paths. Just acknowledge me. Isn't that great? All you have to do is acknowledge him. Say, God, you, not me. God, what are you up to? I don't understand. God, here I am. This is what I'm going to. Just acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. God has made it entirely possible for us to hear and respond to his voice in our day-to-day -day lives through the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's the truth. That's a reality. If we're going to have a relationship with him, it's got to be this way. Because Romans 8, 14 says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. How are you led by a spirit that can't speak to you? Why does the Bible say we have the mind of Christ if we can't hear the voice of Christ? Listen, inviting others into the kingdom of life is not just some random activity we dump on your shoulders to pump up our numbers and say, let's get more people here, so invite them. This is about the discretion of the Holy Spirit. We can do this in obedience to the leadership of the Spirit as He communicates to us in real time. Have you ever felt that nudge? Go talk to that person. Text that person. Go over and sit down next to that person. Listen closely to what they say. Have you ever wondered where those thoughts come from? You think you're that smart. I have ooh, intuitions. <laughs> so I don't ever have that problem thinking I'm that smart. I just don't. But I did learn to trust those thoughts to be the thoughts of God in my life. And here's what I figured out. What do I have to lose? Go with me here. Let's just say that you're at a restaurant. Like Sean Eckhoff does this wonderfully. Sean's here somewhere. We sit down to eat at Denny's, and every time Sean, the waitress would come up and say, Hey, we're about to pray for our lunch. Come with anything we can pray with you about. And, and God is so all over that question. Because we didn't, out of a half dozen times, we never had a person, Mike does this too, Mike, we never had a, a waitress go, no, I'm, no, don't be praying for me. We've had them cry on the spot. Can you imagine that? Is God not in that? If you say, can I pray for you? And someone goes, Ugh, and tears come to their eyes. Or you will, we had them say, you will never believe. I can't believe you just asked me that. Do you think the Holy Spirit's involved in that? Or are we did just that good with our timing? Is it just that powerful to ask somebody just to pray for them? No, oh, I'm telling you, God is at real time active with you. And he wants to speak through you and to you. He wants to have real relationship with you. And learning to recognize the voice of the Spirit, it, it's so important. So here, let's get to the practicals and we'll be done. Here's the practicals. It's best done. It's practiced, okay? This is not a, let's go figure this out and all of a sudden. You just have to learn to trust that it is his voice is the biggest, was for me the biggest obstacle. The question of, is that just my thought or is that God's thought? You ever had that question? Is that me or is that God? 
Go with it. Just say it's God. What are you going to lose there? Nothing. What are you going to find? Oh, that wasn't God. Well, I still did something I thought I probably should do. You think God's going to slap you on the back of the head and say, don't do anything that I, you know, good gosh, why did you pray for that person? Oh, I don't know what to do. You just made a mess out of the whole thing. You shouldn't have talked to them about Jesus. God. I mean, let's just say that it wasn't the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And you talk to somebody and they kind of shrug it off. Oh, well. But let's say it is. And they break down in tears. Or they go home and they wrestle with it. Or, they, or they're just blown away. Or they, or they suddenly, you know, they suddenly see a light and hope just because you asked them, just because you talked to them. And you don't think you even did good. You said, oh, I said, oh, a lot, and I stuttered, and I didn't know what I... But, just, but you did it in obedience to the Spirit. I promise you the Spirit will not let it fail. It's really, really amazing. So practice this in your quiet time with God. Just here's what I do. I'm just going to pull back the curtains, okay? This is what has helped me. And I, and I know that there are others in here that can help you and kind of coach you through this... Tom Morgan could help you. Dwayne Dale could help you. George Berjackley could help you. Mike Reber could help you. Mike Inman could help you. All these people know, I know that they, they know this, but here's what I do, okay? And I didn't know of any other way to, to kind of give you a foothold here if, you've not, if this is strange. Just five to ten minutes of just sitting still and saying, I'm not going to have any noise. Just God, if you want to speak to me, I want to listen right now. And you just let, this is where I started. And you just let thoughts come into your mind. And just, just assume that you, the child of the Father, asking the Father to speak, are going to hear back from the Father. Would He not grant that to you? So I, you know, if I have a crazy, you know, silly thought, I, I, I've had them, you know, when I do this, you can go, God, what do you want me to know? I want some chocolate milk. Well, that's probably me, because I love chocolate milk. <laughs> but God's not frustrated. Don't you sense that Jesus could smile at your crazy thoughts and go, all right, but I have something for you. Listen, I need you to pray this. You know how many times I've heard that. I need you to pray for this person right now. Or even today, I know you might think this is weird, but I know I've heard the Holy Spirit go, would you text that person right now? Would you just send them a message right now and just tell them this? Or would you put that on Facebook? Or would you call this person? Would you have lunch with this person? Or, or, or there are things like, Casey, I need you to know something. I hear this a lot. I need you to know today, fresh and new, I love you. I really do love you. Do you know that? I didn't tell my kids when they were three years old I love them and then never tell them again. I delight in telling them I love them. They might get tired of it, but I love it. <laughs> it's really how I feel. My wife, did I ever go up out of obligation, Kelly, I love you? No, the Father wants to speak to you. Not just marching orders, but truth. That's why he's called the Spirit of Truth. So when God says, I love you, guess what? That's true. I've heard just even last week, Casey, I need you to remember I am with you. And I'm like, oh, man, God, I needed that. I needed to remember that. He's the spirit of truth. And the truth was God was with me. Or Casey, I need you to go and do this. Not because God needed something done. God is not like, I am too busy. Can you do this for me? But I'm going to meet you there. When you go there, I'm there. And we're going to be there together. We're going to do that together. So set aside some time to say, God, speak, and then listen. And even, even, even more lately, what I have done, and I invite you to try this, uh, is just to, I, I write out a lot of my prayers now. Um, that might sound strange or awkward to some, and I don't like to write handwritten stuff anymore, but it's too good to not do now. But what I started doing a few months back was just writing out God's response to me. And I didn't read a book on that uh, or anything. I just felt prompted to do that, so I did it. I just started with Casey, comma. And then guess what I did? I just started writing. 
it, that may not work for everybody. It may not, but I've never had the clarity on God's voice I've had in my life. When I, when I started that, it was just blows me away. Blows me away. The point is that God can and will speak to you real time about people that you should invite, about circumstances that you're in, about truth he wants you to know, about life, because he's a good, good father, and he is not distant. And he's not far. I've given you a challenge there. You can t take, you can modify it, you can do whatever you want. But don't do nothing. Would you make me that promise? Just me and you. It's not going to ask you to sign an oath in blood. But would you just covenant with me to not sit idly on this challenge? Maybe you know God's voice well, but you can, get, you can tune in closer, can't you? You can spend more time listening. You can listen closer. You can be more obedient. Just let's tune in. Let's not do nothing with this. Let's not just nod it off and say good sermon on the way out and then just do nothing. This is too important. If God wants to speak to you, don't you want to hear him in your life? Of course you do. And I'm telling you with every ounce of sincerity in my heart, it can happen in your life day by day. And that's a good, good thing. Pray with me. Father, we are so thankful. I am so thankful that whether I'm driving down the road, and I just say, God, I need you to be near, that I can even envision Jesus with me there, and I can hear his voice speaking to my heart. I can get wisdom. I can get insight. I can get comfort. I can get hope. I can get affirmation. You are such a present communicator of truth in my life. And God, I just, I enjoy that so much. I don't want anybody to miss that. So Father, don't let a person escape this room without getting hold of this. And I pray that 100% of the people sitting here today would hear your voice in real time in their lives, right in their mess, right in their struggles, right in their victories, that they would hear your voice. And you would just say to them, man, I love you. I'm with you. I got a plan. I'm doing good stuff. Really, really good stuff. Oh, Father, would you do it? Light us. and Make us ablaze with your glory. The voice and the present ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The truth. The word of God that's the sword of the Spirit. Speak. And give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen.